okay? So, when I went to uh, automatic tape control in 1965, they had quite an elaborate tape winding facility in there. And I quickly realized that we were spending huge amounts of time rebuilding and building new cartridges for WLS in Chicago. So, knowing that Jim Lupus had worked at, I thought WLS, but he corrected me on that not too long ago, he worked for ABC, which was the parent of uh, WLS, but not directly for WLS. So I went back to Jim and I said, what's the history of the all cartridge operation? And I'll let you read this, but this is his recollection on how it uh, happened. Um, the WLS was originally the Prairie Farmer Station and they concentrated on the Midwest and farming and so forth. And they had uh, bought the uh, P-Series ATC machines um, and that was a prime motivator for ABC because it minimized the musician union uh, record turner uh, or maybe eliminated it. And Fred Zellner was the chief at WQV in Pittsburgh and later at WLS and that's where he really put this whole all cartridge concept into operation. They had commercials, jingles, music, the whole shoot match was on cartridge. So, and they could do it with a combo operator. Um, what year was that? This would have been in the early 1960s and they were using the P-Series machines. They updated those to the PBs or, or possibly the PCs later on. And, uh, um, but, but they had been doing this for several years uh, prior to the time I got there in 65. And very successful of it. We were loading and reloading cartridges like they were going out of style. Uh, so Lupus then moves over to WCFL, which oddly enough is owned by the Chicago Federation of Labor. And uh, he converted it to an all cartridge operation. And uh, some way or the other, he had a real good touch with regard to dealing with the engineers and, and they had a, a very uh, good um, harmonious relationship. So I, I'm not quite sure how all that worked out. But I forgot to tell you, looking up there, George Stevenson. Any of you know George? Well, Bill, our Jim uh, does, and anybody else? Well, okay, another guy up there. Uh, George Stevenson had joined uh, Automatic Tape Control when they split with Collins and they started working on program automation systems. And he designed the first uh, ATC uh, program automation systems and then went off to work for RCA in New Jersey. Later he came back to Chicago and was the chief engineer at, uh, at WCFL. And then he left to rejoin automatic tape control and Lupus moved over in 1965 to WCFL. Uh, and he says many markets were suspicious of cartridges and I remember those days very well. The advertising agencies in some cases prohibited a commercial from being recorded and played on a cartridge machine because they didn't think that the quality was quite satisfactory. Um, and. Uh, he said, uh, okay, that, that's fine, we, that's enough on that. Meanwhile, back in, uh, in Bloomington, some things were going on. And let's go to the next one. And here, Molex Specialties, a recap. They built the first 2,100 uh, P-Series machines for Collins and ATC. And then Collins wasn't real happy with the quality of those machines. You remember I talked about the quality issue with Collins. They were demanding. ATC designed the PV series at that point with a cast aluminum deck. It was a sand casting, and uh, uh, sand castings are inherently uh, soft aluminum. And after you insert a cartridge hundreds of times, it'll start to wear grooves in that uh, sand casting. And so the cartridge becomes a little bit unstable. Um, so uh, they improved on the solenoid linkage assembly and uh, still used the, the full swing and those machines were made by TRW, I think in Boulder, Colorado, and still sold through Collins Radio Company. So Molek, uh, after the split between, uh, after that, the, the, the P-Series went away and was replaced with the PV, they decided they will continue to uh, offer the machines under their own, uh, uh, label 
and uh, they were introduced as the Micarta machines. And so that's about the time that the uh, Collins and, and ATC split occurred. Um, Collins introduced the 642, I've mentioned that, so I got ahead there on, on that a little bit. Let's go ahead. And the 19, in 1964, the first NAB standards for cartridge machines uh, were, were written and adopted by the NAB. So it kind of brought the industry together and there was compatibility between the machines, no longer the programs and the Q-tones and all that sort of thing, you know. So ATC uh, starts manufacturing and marketing their own products on the third floor of the Castle Theater building in, in Bloomington. Um, and, um, and that's this, at the time when George uh, had designed the program automation system. So let's move ahead with that. And they introduced the PC series with the program automation systems because they needed secondary and tertiary Q tones. The secondary tone was used as an end of message signal to start the next event in the program sequence. And the tertiary tones, in their case, was used for logging information. And in some cases, that was used as a signal to the announcer or combo operator that the end of the message was approaching so he could get ready. Um, they launched the ATC 55 that plays 55 cartridges in, in sequence. Uh, and I believe we've got a picture coming up of that. Uh, and they inter introduced this new line of program automation systems designed by George Stevenson. Now, I got ahead because George had left ATC by this time and come back to WCFL and then rejoin. So that is a little bit out of order. But, Mr. Gilmore, can you tell us about this machine? I think about the automation of the... Uh, automation. Uh, <laughs> no, we're talking about the girl? Yeah, I, think, I think that's the machine that was a WJ or WB and Q in uh, Bloomington. I think you're right. And that's the one, I retrofitted that one in 1977 with the Harris microprocessor controller that essentially replaced all the stuff in that middle rack. Was it a common cast? No, they, uh, 55 had a deck that moved up and down on an elevator and then it sucked the cartridges oh. in played them, put the cartridge back in the slot, and then moved up to the, uh, moved down to the next one. And there was an attempt made at random accessing that in around 1975. And uh, when I went to work for Gates in 76, they had kind of given up on that, and they turned that controller for that machine into the System 90 automation control. But it originally was designed to uh, random sequence that 55. That thing would uh, have a big motor of grooves, belts at the bottom to run the, the two uh, screw shafts up and down the move the part machine. There was so much mechanical advantage in those things that it ever got loose and the cart got in the back, it would just shear the front up. It was powerful. <laughs> Machine like that, right? There was, but it wasn't used by Gates. Well, Andy's going to tell you about a uh, RA5. Like George designed that unit to control uh, carousels. And I have the distinction of selling the first Sonomag cartridge uh, carousels. And I sold, sold the whole automation system on the telephone to a station in Montreal, I think it was. And they wanted to use the carousels and use them in a random access concept. And I think George designed it for that particular unit. The switches up at the top would allow you to select from one of five uh, carousels. This one happens to have three. And there are 24 positions on the switches at the bottom. So that would allow you to select which one of the cartridges in that carousel was going to be played. And um, that all sounds great. It's really impressive. And George, uh, this is where I, I uh, love to talk about this. He came up with this. This is all before 
personal computers or anything of this nature. And George used telephone technology to design all these products. Rotary stepper switches and all of those type devices to do a very complex uh, job. And they worked amazingly well, but it was hard the machine, the, the uh, controllers were very complex, and I was at uh, WCHL in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, when one of those uh, screwed up, and George had me inside the rack, and he said, you've got to take the green wire on the fourth card over and unsolder it, and, uh, oh, no, he sent me a replacement card. And I had to get in that darn thing and solder the whole thing in. I was ready to shoot George at that point, but <laughs> it was amazing that the thing worked, but it did. So, I'm not sure where we well, got I there. I tell you by the sound of those stepper relays what was wrong with it. I saw him troubleshoot one on the phone. He said to the guy, he said, hold the phone up to the controller and hit this switch and this switch. And it goes, where, where, George, George said, the e-board relay arts and <laughs> I thought I had uh, met my, uh, I, the, the, my crowning achievement was to troubleshoot by telephone a automation system at WTGR, I can't remember the guy's name that owned it, by telephone sitting in the floor in my dining room on a Sunday afternoon and I thought, that thing is so complex, I don't know how I did it, but I got him to talk through it. Uh, why the mix of the vertical rack of cards and the carousel? You know, I'm not sure. Uh, Jim, do you know why they had sequential operation on one side there? Are, are we... We've lost the picture up there. Oh, well, you couldn't oh, ramp, ramp, yeah, ramp yeah. access to 55. They had to play in sequence on the commercials. They wanted to be able to program which one played at what time. That's why. Yeah, the 55 is a completely non-random machine. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five. You could load them up. It would, it would stick them in, play them, suck them back into the machine, move the machine down one slot, suck them all back in. Yeah. Andy, the, on the left-hand rack, yeah. the carousel that's in the bottom, is that a cruel joke? <laughs> uh, what's wrong with it? I have to see it. By the way, this is a time machine right here. Oh, well, the cars never change. Oh, no, okay, no, I mean the, 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 the far left one. To, to load it up, you got to get on your knees. Oh, yeah. And to fix it, you got to get on your knees. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> those guys were maybe a little bit more nimble than us <laughs> old guys so. are at that time. But, um, yeah, th there's a time machine. The, the bottom cartridge machine, the Criterion over there, uh, is a... Um, uh, a tape that had, I think, every hour or every minute or whatever, and it would make all the announcements. I mean, and if it got out of sequence, oh, God help you. Yeah, an even deck and an odd deck. Yeah. I don't see the cartridge for the other one. But this was, um, what was this record? This was a programmer that was controlling the entire uh, 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 program automation system, and all of the program was recorded on a cartridge. And that was, it used eight kilohertz tones to, uh, uh, to uh, do some of that control. Yeah, that advanced stepper relay controlled what source. And, and while I'm thinking about that and that time machine uh, down there, I, I want to also point out that automatic tape control also built a seven second delay. And there's a gentleman here tonight who may have had one of the first experiences that led to using a seven second delay. Dent Morris was at WSM at that time. You want to tell that story? I will tell that story. <laughs> uh, uh, but you know, a minute ago you used the word, and let me see how old we all are. Does anybody remember the line? I ain't going to hang, I'd say, I ain't going to ride on the bunny seat no more. I'm holding on to your latissimal. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> where the latissimal is. <laughs> Jim remembers it. Okay, that's the story of Baby and Chuck and the motorcycle told by Brother Dave, Dave Gardner. Gardner. And Brother Dave Gardner figures into the tape delay story. But let me just say that Andy over here, I think, was a graduate of the Elkins Institute Absolutely. Radio in Atlanta, <laughs> Got the first Georgia. Phone. And I grew up in Russellville, Kentucky, too, and there was this Andy Rector guy who was a few years older, and he was in radio, 
and he was one of the reasons that I went to the Elkins Institute of Radio <laughs> to get my first phone. And uh, anyway, I wound up wanting to go to college and law school, and WSM gave me that, bless their hearts, gave me that chance, because I couldn't have done it otherwise. So they put me through college, and they put me through law school. Well, anyway, I was there for from 1968 to 1978, and uh, I would do anything. <clears throat> it didn't matter what they had. I didn't care. I needed the money. <laughs> and so I would work any shift, AM, FM, TV. It didn't matter, whatever they had. And somebody had the idea that uh, Ralph Emery needed help on the all-night show, someone to do the news and be kind of the guy to check the back door and that sort of thing. And I was a kid. I was 22 at the time of the story. And, uh, and so uh, I would, if, if somebody came in and they were pretty messed up, and they wanted to come in and be on the show. My job was to say, oh, we're not taking any visitors tonight. The show came on at 10.05 and went till 4 in the morning. And Ralph was, um, if you knew him from television and didn't know him from radio, you missed something because he was a truly gifted guy. He really was. So the, the, the NBC's last newscast was at, <clears throat> I think, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock. And everything on the hour for the rest of the night had to be locally generated. Ralph didn't have a break, so I was his break. And I would do the news and he would get a cup of coffee or something. Well, Brother Dave Gardner grew up in Jackson, Tennessee. And Brother Dave Gardner was a comedian and he got his start because someone tape recorded his show at the something club out near the airport here in Nashville. Somebody might remember that, Jim. And uh, anyway, I uh, <clears throat> took it down to Chet Atkins, I think, and Chet Atkins said, this is funny stuff, and they pressed an album. And Brother Day was hilarious and totally inappropriate today. No question about it. <laughs> he gives you a lot of trouble and he did us. <clears throat> but uh, the Plantation Club, it was a recording on stage at the Plantation Club. Well, one night, and I, and I knew Brother Day from around town and, and I, I knew his album, but I was, I was just this young kid. And I went down, someone rang the doorbell. We were in the middle of the Ralph Emery show, Opry Star Spotlight. And uh, I went to see who had rung the doorbell. Well, Brother Dave was out there, and he had his hair slicked back. He had a little old lady gray hair slicked back for the stage, and he had a, a suit where he had peg sleeves and peg pants, you know. He was a dude. And, uh, and so Brother Dave wanted to come in and be on the show, and he was, he was okay, and I, I brought him on in. Well, this was 1970, and the politics at the time, Albert Gore Sr., Vietnam War, Bill Brock running against Albert Gore Sr., Brock the Republican, Gore the Democrat. And we didn't know that Brother Dave thought himself a big Republican and he was a very big Brock guy and he hated Albert Gore. And so to get to this tale that Andy mentioned, uh, we're, we're talking about whatever, uh, whatever um, Ralph wants to interview him about. And, and, and he keeps coming back to Albert Gore and what a, what a bad guy Albert Gore is. So finally Ralph about two in the morning says, Brother Dave, this, what are you gonna do if, uh, if Al Gore comes to town and wants to take you to task for some of the things that you've been saying about him here on the radio tonight? And Brother Dave doesn't miss a beat. He said, I'm gonna fuck him. <laughs> Pardon my French. Now, you might get away in the 1960s or 70s on radio in the United States with telling a joke about the Pope's uh, mother or something, but you weren't going to say the F word. You weren't going to do that. Well, so there was this two-beat pause of disbelief that, that for both of us that we couldn't believe he said it. And Brother Dave was sitting there grinning at us like a Cheshire, Cheshire cat. He knows what he's done to us. Ralph Emery hits a cartridge runs out of the studio down the hallway and leaves for the low me sitting there and 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 the cartridge runs out well uh, ralph had queued up a record so i hit the record and then ralph came back in and we escorted brother dave out i don't believe he ever came back to the station uh for any reason he wasn't welcome but at any rate um you know, one thing led to another the show was going on and we realized you know in those days you thought the fcc had a wagon and they could just pick you up and disappear with you and you'd never be heard from again. I mean, that's kind of how it was, we thought. And so we knew the protocol was when something like that happened, you had to fire off a telegram to the FCC and tell them what happened and how you were gonna make sure that it never happened again. Uh, so I was gonna go home, Ralph said, nope, nope, you, you gotta do this with me, we gotta wait till management gets me. <laughs> so we waited till management got there and, um, and, and we told them what happened. And so they, they cook up the FCC telegram. And the FCC telegram says, 
Uh, here's what happened. Hor horrible situation. It'll never happen again. And here's how we're going to make sure. We understand there's some technology where you can delay what is said by seven seconds. And we're going to implement that technology. And that's how we're going to solve the problem. And that's what happened. So WSM got its first seven second delay because of Brother Dave Gardner. So there you go. And one of the techniques was to, certain, to, to just wind seven seconds of tape on a cartridge and let it run continuously, erasing and, and going around. Okay, so let's move ahead. Hey, I hope. Wait a minute. One, one cartridge minute. machine to two head devices. How do you do that? Well, it, it, this was a special head configuration. You had an erase head, and the uh, uh, they were juxtaposed. So you were recording and then going around. Uh, playing back and then erasing and then recording again. It was a special head. How did you record the next seven seconds? It, it had an erase. The heads were play, erase, record. Okay. And it was to play yeah. what had been recorded seven seconds before. I just had a seen a car machine with three heads. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's feasible and it, it does work. But of course, uh, that seven seconds of tape again, the lubrication on the tape and everything, those tapes didn't last for a very long period of time. So let's move ahead. Um, okay, so uh, Molex changed their name to uh, Sonomag Corporation, and they also uh, started, uh, let's go ahead, uh, introduced the 24 heart carousel, we've talked about that, and it was bi-directional random access, and uh, they offered also a line of program automation, so we had two companies competing with each other on almost every level right across town from each other, so let's move ahead. and. In 1964, Jack Jenkins started working with Press Weaver at Bow Motor Company on a direct drive inside out. That's where the rotor is on the outside of the motor. And the reason for that is to get the inertia of all that weight on the outside of the motor so that you minimize the wow and flutter. And Jack felt that the 450 RPM was the uh, proper speed for the motor to operate in order to get the largest diameter shaft and make and provide the most contact with the tape. Sonomag went the other way. They used a 600 RPM motor and a more spindly type. Uh, and, and Carl Martin, uh, incidentally, uh, who worked, uh, this will come up in a minute, believed in the 600. So there was a great disparity in, in the feeling about uh, 450 versus 600. Uh, in 65, ATC introduced the Criterion series using the direct drive motor, uh, stereo transistorized electronics, their first tra transistor uh, amplifiers, and the PBPC cast aluminum deck and the solenoid linkage assembly, which was a bit complex and difficult to, uh, to, to uh, adjust. I remember writing the instructions on how to do that. I went through the plant, I interviewed everybody that had ever done it, and none of them did it the same way. So coming, deciphering all that and coming up with one common approach was not an easy thing to do, and I'm not sure it really worked. 1966, automatic tape control was uh, sold to Gates Radio uh, Division of Harris Corporation. Ironic, since uh, Parker had declined to get involved with ATC in the early days. Harris seemed to be primarily interested in the uh, program automation system, which probably made pretty good sense. So uh, let's go ahead. And Jack Jenkins had had some new ideas on, on uh, some improvements he thought could be made to the uh, tape cartridge machine. I remember in one uh, meeting that we had with Larry Simone, who was in charge of Gates at that time, and I said, um, you know, do, do we want to consider some improvements for the uh, tape cartridge machines? And he said, no, we already own the industry. Uh, we're selling the vast majority of the machines. It's good. Let's just stay with it. So uh, Jack had these new ideas for the cartridge machines, which really didn't get discussed. And Harris was, as I said, not very interested. ATC introduced uh, a cartridge alignment tape about that time. And uh, orders started flowing in for the alignment tape. It's like the Ampex alignment tape that everybody's familiar with. You probably had one in the cartridge as well. And we got not only orders from broadcast engineers across the country, but we got them from competitors as well. One of whom was Bill Overhauser at Sparta Electronics. So the guy in whose cubicle was next to mine was one of the most creative people that I've ever met. His name was Dave Wolfenden passed away a few years ago, and uh, 
He took it upon himself to go into our little recording studio and create something special for Bill. Let's go. Hippy dippy test tape. Anybody ever heard of it? So let's take out a little time for doing some cartridge maintenance here. Well, baby, how you doing? <laughs> Uh, this is the gay TC, uh, hippy dippy standard azimuth alignment frequency sponge reference tape. Uh, we're gonna uh, shoot some tones at you here during the next little while, and we're gonna supply you with a little bit of entertainment too, uh, mainly because it's uh, probably three o'clock in the morning when you're working uh, there at the radio station. And, and if you're working on them lousy cartridge machines at three o'clock in the morning, I tell you, boy, you're gonna need some entertainment. Okay, here we go. Now, we're going to shoot a tone down at you here. Yeah, the first tone going to be 15,000 hertz. Uh, that's the opposite of an Avis. All you got to do now, you adjust the reproduce head azimuth uh, so you get the maximum reading on the VU meter there. There's a little thing with a needle waving right in front of you right now. So uh, get ready now. Uh, get, your, uh, get your screwdriver all set there on the, on the thing. Get the wrench there. Uh, you got it on there? Hmm? You're all set to go? Okay, here the tone. Okay, now we're going to throw you another tone down. What's that? You say you missed the tone. Oh, well, I'm sorry about that. You may as well just listen to the rest of the cartridge until we get around through this whole 31-minute tape, and then you start over again and line the thing up, because nothing you do from here on is going to do any good unless you've got that first tone. So we stop at that point. The, Dave was, uh, he, he, since we were going to wait for the 31 minutes, he provides a little entertainment, and it gets really kind of blue. <laughs> but a few days later, we get a call from, from Sparta. <laughs> and Bill is on the phone, and he, I, I can hear Dave in the cubicle next to me saying, yeah, uh, how did that go? He said, in essence, the translation was, you, you shut the entire company down, the cartridge arrived, was delivered to the guys in the test department, within 15 minutes the entire plant had migrated to the test department and everybody was listening to the hippie dippy testing. So I guess we accomplished it, we destroyed our competition in one fell swoop. So let's go. <laughs> So anyway, we had, we had a lot of fun in those days, and, and I've worked with a really interesting and uh, creative group of people. In 1969, Harris announced that ATC would be moved to Quincy, Illinois, and Franklin, uh, that's Elmo Franklin, who was my boss at uh, Automatic Tape Control, Jack Jenkins, who had been working for Ted Bailey, and, and I will say that uh, Jack made some huge contributions to the design of the cartridge machines at that time. I uh, moved over as well, and a guy named Merle Wilson, uh, he was like Jack Jenkins' right-hand man. Jack would come up with a mechanical concept and say, Merle, can you get me something that looks like this and that and so forth, and here's a little sketch of what I want it to look like. And Merle had this uncanny ability to capture that and come back to Jack with what he wanted and they'd modify it and get it just right. So they had a really close working relationship. ITC introduced the premium line cartridge machines consisting of the uh, SP series which is this machine right here and recording amplifier was the RP and then the 3D machine which is over on the far side over there. And uh, they were uh, immediately very successful. Okay, so let's move ahead and where does that take us? Okay, that was called the premium line and uh, then let's see, uh, it was based on the 450 RPM motor from Bo. Uh, it had a very simplified chain uh, drive linkage assembly, solenoid linkage assembly. Jack in essence took a little bicycle chain, a miniature bicycle chain, wrapped it around the, the uh, pressure roller shaft and attached it to the end of a solenoid and eliminated about 15 parts in a very complex mechanical assembly. And I think that was Jack's uncanny genius at simplifying mechanical devices that other people tend to make real complex and difficult to adjust and difficult to maintain. Uh, we switched to a machine tool grade aluminum deck Mach uh, the machine grade aluminum is much harder than the sand castings and therefore resistant to the grooves that I had described that would happen in the uh, sand castings. We improved the tape guides, or he did, uh, on that machine and uh, improved some hum, hum shielding and uh, 
used a pressure roller. Oh, not everything we did was a success. We didn't have any money when we started ITC. And so as a result, we found out that the tooling for a pressure roller with a centered bronze bearing in it and the rubber attached to it and all that sort of thing was going to be enormously, enormously expensive. So we decided to use a uh, eight track pressure roller with a nylon bearing and it was a disaster. So we had to recover from that and um, we got permission from Collins, the old friends of Collins came back and they allowed us to use tooling that they hadn't used for years at Minnesota Rubber Company and we were back in business with a proper pressure roller. Merle Wilson uh, at that time uh, designed some tools and we were shipping them out to our customers with new pressure roller shafts, new pressure rollers, and you could put this across the cross shaft in the machine, press out the uh, pressure roller shaft, press in, reverse the handle, and press in a new one. And our customers were so enthusiastic about the machines, they were willing to do that. And uh, it was a success, so we turned a really bad situation into a good one. Um, Plow Broadcasting about that time, Elmo Franklin and I took off, and, and I cannot remember the chief engineer's name at Plow at that point. Fine gentleman, and he uh, was kind enough to bless us with the first major order that we received at ITC. Uh, we used at that time a direct sales approach, which would be referred to as telemarketing today. And uh, let's go ahead and uh, direct mail advertising. And we emphasized quality and prompt uh, uh, solution to, to uh, problems that our customers had. And I think we built some really good long-term relationships with those people. So great success and growth for the company. So then we introduced the Encore machine, near disaster. We felt like we needed to go after the lower cost machines and, and try to get capture part of that market. And so we took a stainless steel deck and attach that 450 RPM motor, which I don't know, I never weighed one, five pounds. <laughs> it's, it's pretty heavy. They work fine if you could get them to the customer, but if somebody dropped the box, it torqued that darn stainless steel deck, and so it was not a really, not a success story. And all at, along about that same time, we were selling a lot of uh, the premium line machines. Uh, again, that's this machine here to uh, European stations, which uh, Pirate Radio, you remember the, all those things that were starting to do top 40 and so forth, so they were buying cartridge machines. But they wanted to use 220 volts and, uh, and 50 hertz. So we had Bo make the motors for those machines and they started overheating. In fact, I think we might have had a fire or two along the way. So we started looking for, and, and a Bo didn't seem to be able to correct the problem, so we reached out to uh, Japan Servo and used their motors for a while, and then uh, by the time I left, uh, we sold the company to 3M. We were using a Pabst uh, motor, a German uh, motor, which was a very fine um, tape recorder motor, so. Uh, and and uh, we continued to sell a lot of machines into, uh, into the Europe. Um, somewhere along in that time frame, Carl Martin um, broke away from ITC and started Audicord Corporation. And by the way, later on, uh, I bought the company from Carl and we shortened it to just ACC. Now we've got ATC, ITC, <laughs> ACC, <laughs> and SMC. So we got four different companies, and I, I, I'm getting ahead of myself again, so let's go. Um, Mark, uh, Carl Martin probably is the only guy that actually worked on a full-time basis for all four of those companies at one time or the other. And of course, he owned uh, Audicore Corporation at the end. And then I came in and we uh, uh, closed out the cartridge machine industry in, at the end of the 1990s, 2000. And we got into the business of building printed circuit boards, uh, still electronic assembly and so forth, and I shortened that to ACC Electronics. So, Audicord introduced a new line of less expensive machines. This is when Carl broke away from ITC using the 600 RPM motor. And uh, who was it today telling me about buying 20 or so of those machines? They had a great reputation and uh, were, were a fine machine. So, 
And we always maintained a, a really good working relationship with all of our competitors in Bloomington Normal. So let's move ahead. Uh, okay, so Jack uh, then decided that uh, the NAV standards needed to have some revisions. Uh, he had some new ideas on cartridge machine improvements and he wanted to make sure that everything was right to move in some of those directions. So uh, he uh, kind of chaired that uh, operation and got the NAV uh, standards revised. And that was in the 70s, and I think, didn't somebody tell me today that there was an 84 version of the NAB standards as well? Forgotten who mentioned that. I've never seen that one because I was out of the industry by that time. In 1979, ITC introduced the Series 99 machine. And it was probably, and I don't think we have one of those here, but uh, it was the last uh, cartridge machine that, that I had anything to do with, and we, uh, Jack really, busted his can to come up with a fine machine here. It was microprocessor based, had a built-in tape eraser, had auto azimuth alignment, so, um, and, and by the way, the, I mentioned at the beginning, the cartridge is kind of a flawed concept because if you've ever noticed, the tape has to come up and out of the center of the cartridge and around some guide posts and so forth, and you have to get it in proper control so that when it passes the record head, it will be in perfect synchronization with the playback head. And when that tape is doing all these angles and so forth, it's really hard to do. And so what Jack came up with, we're never gonna solve that with the cartridge, so we'll have to do it with the machine. And so you put the cartridge in the machine, it, since it started recording a high frequency tone on the, the cartridge, and it would adjust the record head so that it was perfectly in line with the playback head and then you were, would erase the tape and you were ready to record. So it was kind of a, 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 an interesting approach, a complex way to solve the shortcomings of the cartridge. It also had a splice locator and had a servo motor control system and toroid power supply, all trying to get you know, the signal to noise ratio down into reel-to-reel -reel type standards and things of that nature. And the same air damp solenoid that we had had. But that reminds me too, because I talked to Charlie Bates, who was the uh, last um, um, engineering director at, AT, at ITC. And he said that we, um, I asked him if we didn't have a ball locking solenoid. Jack had come up with the idea if you leave that solenoid engaged for a long time, it is working really hard and it creates a lot of heat. And so he wanted to come up with a concept where he could reduce the uh, current flow through that solenoid. And he had a ring milled into the solenoid plunger and inside the barrel of the solenoid was a little um, uh, like a BB. And of course, all the magnetic strength is being sucked through the center of that uh, solenoid plunger, and it would suck that uh, ball down into that, uh, uh, to that groove and latch it into place. It was a great concept. We never could perfect the thing to get it to work the way we wanted, and so it was never introduced as a product. But Charlie Bates was saying, it's characteristic of the type of improvements that we were constantly working on at ITC to improve the cartridge concept and make it a better machine than it was before. Okay, so um, along about that time, Jack Williams on the West Coast at Pacific Recorders and Engineering introduced his Tomcat machine. Anybody remember that machine? Okay. Uh, if Jack had come out with that machine in 1958, it would have been fantastic because he solved some of the incompatibility problems that the industry had fought from the very beginning. But as 3M had, had with, uh, um, I think I'm getting ahead of myself again, but at any rate, uh, his machine was, uh, was adopted by many uh, broadcasters and it was a great machine. It was just too late in the uh, cycle of things to introduce a totally new concept in my opinion. So, hat off to, to, uh, to Jack Williams, but uh, it was a little bit late. Okay? Uh, 3M started to work on a Centra cart concept. And in this case, they put the heads in the middle of the cartridge so that the tape would run on a constant level and then at the very end of the process come up, up and out of the center. And it was a greatly improved cartridge concept. Two problems. Number one, 
the cartridge had to be inserted and lowered over the head assembly. And number two, it would require a total change in all of the machines you had in your radio station. So you're going to dump everything. They did a lot of research on that and decided that they would not move forward with that concept. And uh, let's go ahead to the next one. So in, in, on January 1, 1982, ITC was sold to 3M. What they did is they came up with the scotch cart concept, and Jim, you had that. In the 3D. It's, it's around here someplace. In the 3D. It's in the 3D machine. Oh, this it? I thought that was black. I couldn't see that. But, um, no, that's, yeah, that is scotch cart too. So this one is a little bit different. You might pass that around and just look at it if you aren't familiar with the scotch cart. But now they had the leader of the industry, and according to the research I did, we had about 60% of the market uh, for cartridge machines in, uh, at, at about 1982, at the beginning of 1982. And they had a new cartridge concept, which was a, a pretty good improvement over the original Kuzno or Fidelipak cartridge. Okay, so, uh, and the car, so I've already gotten that one, so excuse me for getting ahead. About that same time, Bo, who was no longer supplying our uh, motors, uh, decided that they would become a competitor and they interest, uh, introduced the Bo cart. And Fidelipak, who now had a uh, competitor in uh, 3M with the Scotch cart, decided to go into competition as well and they introduced the Dynamax machines. And then uh, 3M. Uh, ITC launched the Delta series. Who asked me about when that happened? So that's kind of the sequence of events on the Delta. I guess that was the next cart machines. And I think that was about the time we sold the company. So let's move ahead. Um, mid 80s, digital audio starts to appear. And in 1990, um, interestingly enough, 3M had never quite, they, one of the attractions to selling the company to 3M to me was that they had introduced some really good digital reel-to-reel -reel machines. And the um, idea that I had was that they would take those concepts and pass them along to the broadcasting industry and, and maybe do some fantastic things. That never really happened. And so in 1990, they sold the company to uh, 3M, or to uh, two Canadian investors, one of whom was a, a 3M employee. In 1991, Carl Martin called me up, said I'm 64, I've got bladder cancer, and I think it's time to hang it up. Would you be interested in buying the company? And I thought, you know, if anybody is going to end this industry, it's probably not the Cadillac dealer, it's going to be the Chevrolet dealer that'll probably be selling the cart machines. And so I thought, well, I've got about a five-year window, and I think I could take the company and do something with it. And eventually what we did is uh, we converted it to electronic manufacturing, which we do today. Okay. Uh, so in 1999, 2000, essentially the end of the uh, tape cartridge. <coughs> 